Let's turn to uh, John chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading in verse 8 in just a moment. I've been sharing with you uh, really for some weeks now on the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, I preached for a period of time about power to be. And now, uh, not only do I want us to understand the, the power of the Holy Spirit to be his witness, God enables us to do that, but I want to make sure that we know how to receive that power. And that's what we've been working on these last couple of weeks, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. It's more simple than you can imagine. Can I tell you what somebody shared with me this morning? Their daughter was at a, 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 a young girl, probably 10 to 12 years of age, uh, over the weekend, a uh, spend the night party. And uh, we've been teaching this here at Calvary. They've been teaching it in our student ministries. And the mother whose home the spend the night party was in walked in. There were five young girls sitting in a circle on the floor, weeping, praying in unknown tongues. The young lady from our church had shared this with them, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all five of the little girls were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to worship God in a heavenly language. Parents were thrilled. It's not hard to receive a promise God wants to give you. And so we're just walking in that and doing that. Let me say a couple of things to us. I, I want you to know why I sense the Holy Spirit's urgency for us to understand the power of the Holy Spirit now, to understand how easy it is to receive that gift, the anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how much God desires to do that in every one of our lives on an ongoing basis. But, but where we are now in history, I want you to think about this. We're the church. We represent Christ on this earth. And I want you to think about your role, the role of the church, how important this is. Do I have your attention? I want you to get this. Why the urgency of the Holy Spirit? Well, we are living, you need to understand this, and I believe the most strategic moment in maybe the history of anyone's lifetime right now, more strategic than ever. I, as I pray over this time and, 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 and assume the awesome responsibility to shepherd a church during this time, to be a servant leader and a pastor. Uh, we're living in a season that, that, that I pray and I wonder, what will history say about us? What will history say about us? Your grandchildren will read about the 2020 and the coronavirus. Your grandchildren will read about uh, what happened to deal with social justice or injustice at this moment. History will record what we do in this hour. Maybe never been a more strategic moment. I don't think I could tell you that you could ever overestimate the value of your life right now. The value of your life. I don't, I don't think any of us fully comprehend the value of your life as a believer living in this moment in the United States of America. I want that to sink in for you. The value of your life. I, I, I don't know that, that we understand how close God is to us right now, how close he is. say, so what do you mean, Pastor? Things are crazy in this culture. <laughs> they are. But you know what the Bible says? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. In our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. I don't know if we fully understand unless we sit down like this. Shut the doors on all the noise. Worship God and then open his word and really come to the moment. Do we understand how close he is? How valuable your life is right now? I, I just, I want us to grasp it, not in an overwhelming way, but in understanding. This is not our moment to be run over by, by what's happening. It's the, mo it's the church's moment to rise up and do great things for God. I, I don't know if we, I, I just want to impress it on you again about how important it is for every one of us just to recognize just living for Jesus, representing Jesus is huge right now. How you go to work right now, how you love your wife, how you love your husband, how you raise your children, how we go to church, how we respond to what's going on around us, how we go to school. I, I, I can tell you that Christians being Christians right now, not just church attenders, not just online viewers, but Christians being Christians has never been more important than it is right now. Then I want to come to this. I, I, I want to make sure we understand 
how God wants us to receive and release the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the solution, solutions, the answers for what we're grappling with in our culture today are going to come from the hand of God and no other source. And so your value, your place, the nearness of God, the, the, the strategy of your life, who we are as the church, who we are as individuals has never been more important than it is right now. So let's, let's, I want us to understand that people sometimes miss that. We're, we're going, I'm going to read here in, in John 14, beginning in verse number 8, and I want you to see, here we, this, this setting is the Last Supper, the upper room, the Last Supper. Jesus is less than six hours from his arrest where he would be crucified the next day. These men in this room with him had walked with him three and a half years. Are you with me? Three and a half years. These men had seen every miracle, heard every teaching, picked up the loaves and the fishes after 20,000 people were miraculously fed from one meal, okay? These guys saw that. But watch this. In, in these final hours, verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's why Jesus came, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Look at verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. He said, what have you seen? Now, he's talking about miracles here, okay? Is that clear? And then look at verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Now, that's a shock. I told you that to end last week. And then the next statement Whatever you want to say blows your mind, flips your lid, cranks your tractor, wakes you up in church, raises the dead. He will do even greater things than these. But then there's, there's something you can't miss here because there's a connection here. I'm going to be with the Father. So Jesus is... is right here in the final moments with these disciples, these that will be the apostles and lead the church. And, and they're still trying to figure out, is he really God in the flesh? Is he really who he says he is? And Jesus says, if you can't get this for any other reason, what do you do with the three and a half years of miracles that you've seen? The raising of the dead, the feeding of the multitude, the walking on the water, the calming the storm. Come on, God, that's me. And, he, and, and they're just, he, so, okay, okay, okay. He says, but I won't need you to know, you're going to do what I've been doing and greater things. And they're just reeling with this information. He said, because I go to be with the Father. Now, what they were struggling with is what I call the first incarnation. Usually it's the only incarnation. What does that mean? That's when God put on flesh and stepped in this planet. It's when the Holy Spirit placed Jesus in the womb of Mary and God himself lived inside the body that was birthed. Through the womb of Mary. God put on flesh and walked on this planet. That's how all this happened. But I want you to look at something with me uh, because he said it's going to be greater. It's going to become greater. So, so what happened? There was this God clothing himself in human flesh through the work of the Holy Spirit and began to reveal the Father to the world. To a world that was struggling. What is God like? Who is God? What would God do? How big is he? What's his nature? Jesus put on flesh through the virgin birth. Stepped into this world. And we saw the Father. We saw what God was like. It, 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 it revolutionized. But then he says it's going to get greater. Now, I, I, I would have read. And we, we, we've had a wonderful prayer time. And so I, I can't read all of this. But I want us to go to Luke chapter 1. Let, I want you to see this because, God, I want you to see we're talking about how to receive this. How to receive this, this anointing of the Holy Spirit so we can be who we're supposed to be right now. Now, what happened? Jesus had come. He had lived his life. He had demonstrated who God is, his nature, his works, his love, his power. And he says, yet something greater is going to happen. 
So how did that happen the first time? How did God put on flesh? How did Jesus reveal the Father? In, in, in Luke chapter 1, I'm, I'm going to drop down to verse 34. The angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you have favor. God's chosen you. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. And we go to verse 34. Watch this. And, and, and Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Everything I told you a moment ago, we could be tempted to say, Pastor, come on. How am I going to do that in this time? How are me and my family going to represent Christ? How are we going to see this? How are we going to grab the moment? What will history say about us? What will this moment be like? Will we only remember the coronavirus or will we remember the corona revival? And you say, so Lord, how can this be? Come on, have any of you ever read the scripture? Have any of you ever read the Bible? Have any of you read John 14, 12 and said, how is this going to be besides me? Can I see your hand? Anybody honest in the house? Anybody ever seen the will of God and said, God, did you get the right person? I remember when God called me to be a pastor. I said, God, I love y'all. Do anything you want me to do. But I think the wires got crossed and you were calling somebody else and not me. And, you know, you called the wrong number and got me. I don't think I'm the guy. See, if you've never said, how will this be? Then you've never seen God's will for your life. Because God's will for your life is always bigger than you, greater than you. So Mary says, okay, how is this going to be? And look, notice, notice, notice what happened. Verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. How are we going to be a witness right now? The Holy Spirit is going to come upon us. How many want the Holy Spirit to come upon you? How about your children? How about your marriage? How about your family? How about your job? How about our church? How about our nation? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Everybody understand how God does what we can't do? How are you going to do this? How did God lead heaven, put on human flesh, be birthed of a woman, a young virgin, and step into this world to change it? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit makes the difference. Watch, watch with me. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power, someone say power, the power of whom? The Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Are you ready for verse 37? Now, the, the, the older uh, New International Translation, which I have in my Bible, says this, verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. I want you to say that. Come on, say it with me. For nothing is impossible, how? With God. But let's look here. Look, look what we read in the newer translation. Saying the same thing in a different way. This isn't a, a conflicting uh, translation from the language. Look, for no word from God will ever fail. How is nothing impossible with God? Because no word from God will ever fail. Now watch this. What did Mary do then? Come on, you have to see this. I'm teaching you, receive the power. She said, how is this going to happen? You, you, I, I can't give birth to a baby. I'm not married. I'm a virgin. I don't have a man. I, this is impossible. And what did he say? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will encounter your impossibilities. The Holy Spirit will do what you can't do, for nothing is impossible with God. And then what does she say? Look at verse 38. I want you to see it. I am the Lord's what? Servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mine says, may it be to me as you have said. Come on, say it that way. May it be to me as you have said. So what did Mary do? To receive the power to give birth to the Son of God. She just received it. She just believed it. The greatest miracle that happened on this planet came not because Mary worked for it, earned it, paid for it, did this, did that. She took God at his word. She received. Do you and I understand today? Do you know how the power of God transforms your life and mine? We just take God at his word. We just say, God, do what you said you would do. May your word be fulfilled to me. Are you with me? Now, that's how it happened originally. And those disciples are grappling with that. Did, is this really God? Did God really come walk among us? I mean, we touch him, we sleep with him. I mean, I don't mean disrespectful. I don't know. Maybe they heard him snore at night. They knew what he liked to eat and what he didn't like to eat. I know we don't like to think of God that way. But they lived with him three and a half years. 
And they were struggling. And he said, you've seen too much to know I'm just a man. And they said, okay, okay, okay. And then he says, now, you're going to do what I've been doing. Whoa. And you're going to do greater things. How did that happen? What happened for Mary? God, how can this be? The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. For nothing is impossible with God. And then she said, well, okay, if you said it, I believe it. If it's your promise, I receive it. I'm not looking at me. I'm looking at you. I'm going to stop looking at my inability. I'm going to start looking at your promises. Everybody with me right now? That's the incarnation. That's the birth of Christ. That's how he got his body on this earth to do what he did and then go die on the cross, shed his blood, be raised from the dead three days later and defeat death, hell, and the grave. But he said to those disciples, I'm going to leave you. But you're going to do what I've been doing. It's just an overwhelming thought. So let's think about this. How's that going to happen? He told them in that same chapter that I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. The Holy Spirit has been with you, but he's going to be where? He's going to be in you. And then after the death and resurrection, he said, you go stay in Jerusalem. What did they do? They're praying there in the upper room. And let's read uh, Acts chapter 2. Come on, turn it with me in verse 1, Acts 2, 1. Let's read this. So I want you to see something. I want you to see the parallel. It's, it's, it's the introduction of how John 14, 12 is going to happen in our lives today. So he told them, you wait. John baptized in water. I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So here's this group, 120, Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. Filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw it seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. A crowd gathered, hearing these languages, said, what in the world is going on? Peter said, this is what Joel prophesied. In the last days, I'll pour my Spirit out on all flesh. And then he began to preach the gospel, and 3,000 people got saved. And every Christian theologian today agrees the church began on that day. Watch what happens. I call it the second incarnation, the second body of Christ. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, the first time he came, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, placed him in her womb. She birthed his humanity, and Jesus represented God to us. But he died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and ascended back to heaven. Now he calls the church the body of Christ. It's not the body he came in, but now the Holy Spirit's done the same thing to you and I that he did to Mary in Luke chapter 1. In other words, the Spirit of God came on all of us who said, how can this be? How in the world are you going to do what you say you're going to do? And he said, I'm going to do it the way I've always done it. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. And I'm going to begin to go to men and women everywhere on this planet, in every tongue, every race, every creed, every country. And as they accept me as their Savior, I'm going to move into their life with the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm going to do is build a new body for me to keep representing the Father on this planet. And do you understand the church today is the body of Christ? We came about the same way his first body came about when he began to do the gospel. In other words, he said, just because this body is going back to heaven doesn't mean there's not a body on the planet. And so the same way Jesus walked the streets of Israel and healed the sick and raised the dead and preached the gospel, the church the body of Christ has now been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what he did, to carry on what he started. How did we do that? How do we do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been equipped. We've been anointed. We've been called to this moment. It, it, it's an amazing, amazing thing. You see, when you, it's not all the answer, but you begin to see part of the answer. What happened? When Jesus was here in the first body that God birthed and brought about to, to represent the Father, it, the miracles could only happen if you were in reach of Jesus. The, the blind could only be healed if Jesus was there to heal the blind. There was one time he authorized 70 to go out and preach and heal, but they came back, and then that was the end of it. 
And so what happened with the first body, if a miracle happened, he had to physically be there. If, if, if the dead were raised, he had to physically be there. But in the second body in the church, I want you to think of it. Now, we're not limited to one man, one place. We are the body of Christ. Everywhere you go, Jesus goes. You understand that? In every nation where there's a believer, Jesus is in that nation. In every school where there's a young student that believes in Jesus, he's in that school. In every home where someone's born again and believes in Jesus, he's in that home. So now, who can be healed? People can be healed on every country on the face of this planet, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The things he did, we can do. Why? Because there's more of the body to go around today than there ever was initially. Jesus understood that. He looked at them and said, you guys need to get this. I'm doing what I'm doing because the Father lives in me. Because the Holy Spirit birthed me in the, in the womb of Mary, conceived me, and I was birthed. He says, and what you need to understand, he said, you need to get it. You need to stop worrying, am I the son of a God? Because I'm about to leave, and you're supposed to keep doing what I've been doing. Right, right. And greater things. And so, let's look at this. Let me just, just, I'd love to even take more time, but let's look at this for a minute. Go back to John 14, 12 and read that with me. Let's take one more look at this verse. The context is miracles. The context is understanding who he is. Church, we're the body of Christ. What he did in that first body, we've just seen. The church came about the same way through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says this. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because... See, there was a reason. Because I'm going to the Father. Now, what would happen from that statement until the time he returned to the Father that hadn't been done yet? What, what would happen there to enable that promise to become a reality? In other words, he says, right now I'm doing it. But by the time I go back to the Father, something's going to shift that allows you to do it. He said, now what is this? Okay, what happened after that statement in the interim from that statement in John 14, 12 until the day he ascended back to heaven? What happened? There were 40 days. Well, actually, 43 days. Three days in the tomb and 40 days after. What happened there? Well, number one, the cross had not taken place yet. When in John 14, 12, he had not yet gone to the cross. And John 14, 12 uh, there, there was no salvation available to the whole world. There was promised, but it hadn't been secured. See, I, let, let's look at Colossians 2, 13 through 15. I want you to see this. See, the first thing that, that you need to understand, what happened after that statement? Because he went back to the Father, he, he, he would go to the cross. He knew that was going to change everything. He knew that, as I shared with you, we're about to have a new body of believers. And, and I, I don't want you to look at this. I want you to look in your Bibles, Colossians 2, and verse 13. Have you found that? I want you to see it because it's, it's dynamic. Colossians 2, verse 13. Let me read it. When, watch this. When you were dead in your sins, everybody that heard that statement was there. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. Watch this. He forgave us all our sins. Look at verse 14. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Do you know what happened after John 14, 12 to enable it to become a reality? Are you with me? He went to the cross. And the Bible says when Jesus died on the cross, he took every charge that was ever made against you and I, every sin we ever committed, every punishment we ever deserved, and he took that with him to the cross. Are you with me? And those wicked men thought they were nailing Jesus to the cross. But according to Colossians, too. They were nailing your sins and mine to 
the cross. They were nailing my punishment to the cross. They were nailing my guilty verdict to the cross. You see, up until then, even the disciples, even those close to him, even those that were believing in him, never had the joy of my sins forgiven. They were just covered in the temple on the day of atonement. They were never forgiven. They were just covered. They were just waiting. But Jesus went to the cross and he said, the day of pushing judgment back is over. I'm paying judgment today and there is nothing held against you because of the cross. Not only that, we see what did he do in verse 15? He disarmed the powers and authorities of hell. He disarmed the devil. Do you hear that? He disarmed the demons. He disarmed everything hell sent against us and made a public spectacle of him triumphing over him by the cross. The cross happened. The victory happened. His blood was shed. Satan would be defeated. See, up until that time, only Jesus had the authority of the Father to do what he did on this planet. But do you understand through the cross? Come on. Somebody needs to get this. We were forgiven. We were released. We were redeemed. And we were authorized to step into the place and do what he did. Tell the demons to flee. Tell the sick to be healed. Tell the lost to come home that happened greater thing it's happening there are a billion christians on this planet right now one billion do you get that one billion do you understand there are one billion people on this planet today with the authority to cast out demons raise the dead heal the sick preach the gospel greater things than ever happened until that time amazing I want you to look at Colossians 1.13. Good grief in the morning. I could preach this till next week, but I won't. Don't worry. Colossians 1.13. Look at this. this. This hadn't happened yet because for he what? He rescued us. Look at this. I love this. I got to see what it says. Yeah, look at this. For he rescued us from the dominion. Do you know what dominion means? Authority, the right to control. For he rescued us from the dominion of what? darkness of hell and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loved you know what the cross did for you and i it denied satan's authority over your life from the moment you become a christian the dominion and the authority of satan is broken he no longer has the right to control your life will he try to of course does he still try to whisper in your ear? Yes. Does he still try to remind you of who you were and what you felt? In fact, he has a lot of people that will help him do that all the time. They won't believe who you are. They don't trust what God has done. Every time the Spirit of God wants to use you, there will always be a voice that says, Who do you think you are? What makes you think you can do this? What gives you the right? All we have to say is I've been rescued from the dominion of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God. And if the devil had me then, God has me now. Everyone that's happened to will understand it. Everyone that hasn't received that will never understand it. But you just keep serving God. Rescued. Authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, after he had been raised from the dead and the disciples came to him, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, he said, I have come through the cross and taken the authority Satan has had, and now I'm transferring it to you. The cross changed everything. The cross changed everything. The blood of Jesus changed everything. Changed it all. And, and, and the, the, something else would happen. I've got to just expedite. I'll give you digest, reader's digest. The next thing, there are three things. I'm going to hurry. This one, I'll go shorter and shorter until we get there. All right. The resurrection. Look at Ephesians 1.19. Come on, find it. Hurry. Ephesians 1.19. The resurrection. See, when he said in John 14.12, when he said, you'll do greater things because I go to the Father, after that statement, he would die on the cross. After that statement, he would not only die on the cross, he'd be raised from the dead. None of that had happened yet. You understand? That enabled greater things to take place. Don't doubt John 14, 12. Embrace John 14, 12. Come on, amen? Don't doubt it. Embrace it. Believe it. The resurrection from the dead was the 
sealed the victory of what Jesus did on the cross. Had he not been raised from the dead, everything he did on the cross would have been wasted. Look at Ephesians 1, 19. Let's read a little bit here. I want to go through verse 23. Are you with me? I want you to follow along. And his incomparably great what? Power for whom? For us. Who do what? Earn it, pay for it, buy it, struggle, sweat, spit, run? No. For us who what? Believe. How do you receive this power? You believe. How do you receive the power? What did Mary do? She just believed the word of God. What did the 120 in the upper room do? They just did what he said. They just prayed. You know what they were doing when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Praying and praising. They weren't wrestling. They weren't fighting. They weren't saying, are we worthy? Did we earn it? Do you love us? I don't know. They were just praying and praising. And they received it. How do we receive the power of God? Let's get verse verse 19. Let Let me continue on. He says to us, and his incomparably great power for us who believe, Look at this. Look at this. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So see, the resurrection of, the, of Christ was the demonstration of the power of God. It's like the raising him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Look at this. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also the one to come. Look at this. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for what? The church, which is his what? Body, which is his what? Body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Dude, dude, come on, guys. We got to get this terminology. Jesus said between now before I'm about to be crucified, but before I ascend back to heaven, some things are going to so radically change on this earth that you will do what I've done in greater things. How? Number one, because of the cross that defeated the devil and forgave our sin. Number two, the resurrection showed the power of God and literally said because of the resurrection, I put Jesus, I want you to get this, who is the head of the church. Do you understand the body of Christ who we are, his physical body on this planet, that the church is so strong that we are the fullness of Christ as we serve him. That Satan is under our feet. I do that sometimes before I preach. But just for fun, while you're sitting, I want you to get your foot and I want you to just rub it a little bit. Come on. Quit acting like you don't know what you're doing. Come on, rub it. Rub it in on the devil. Has the devil ever rubbed it in on you? Has he ever told you about all the sins you committed when you were younger and how nobody loves you and your family forsook you and you don't have what you need? Rub it in on him right now. Come on, some of you act like you love the devil. I didn't say give him a massage. I said rub it in on him. He's not your friend. Don't feel sorry for him. You've been wanting to hate somebody. The only person you can hate is the devil. You've been wanting to get mad at somebody. Why don't you get mad at the devil? You want to tell, put somebody in their place. Why don't you put him in his place right now? Put him under your feet. You want to act bad, act bad right now. You want to bob your head, bob your head right now. You want to act like you all that in a bag of chips, do it right now. You want to be big, bad, and brave, do it right now. You want to put your chest out, do it right now. You want to be a man, do it right now. We're mad at the wrong people. (laughs) We're fussing and cussing. We need all to be stepping on the head of the devil. He's under our feet. Why did greater things and even greater happen? Because of the cross, because of the resurrection. And I'll end it here because I can pick it up. (laughs) And because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. See, we not only have know Jesus as our Savior now, we know Jesus as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit, listen to this Romans 8, Romans 8 said, we just read about the power of God to raise him from the dead. Romans 8 and verse 11 says, The same Spirit that raised him from the dead 
quickens our mortal bodies right now. Come on, someone say the same spirit. The same spirit. Those 12 disciples in that room taking that last supper did not have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living in them that night. They had not been born again through the work of Jesus on the cross. They had not been forgiven and given authority over hell. But now watch this. Not only do we have the authority over Satan through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to do something about it. See, authority is the right to use the power. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? If you don't know you have authority, you don't know how to use your power. If you try to use your power without authority, you're a rebel. But when you get authority in Christ and power through his spirit, then you become a dynamo for God. There's a billion of us on this planet. There's a billion of us on this planet who've been born again, forgiven at the cross, raised from the dead, seated with Jesus, the devil under our feet, the power of God operating in our life. I'm going to tell you, COVID-19 is no match for the power of Almighty God. Fear is no match. Lack is no match. Hatred is no, no match. We serve the God who does greater things. 